Well, thank you very much for coming to uh, the New America Foundation. It's with a great deal of pleasure that uh, I get the, the honor of introducing my long-time uh, friend and, and colleague at CNN, David Ensor, who's now the Director of Communications and Public Diplomacy at the uh, U.S. Embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan, a job he assumed in January of, uh, of last year. Um, David, is uh, the title of this talk is about building an effective civilian communication strategy in Afghanistan, so David is going to really focus on that. He uh, questions that uh, don't fall into that uh, area. He, he may entertain, but he also may not. Uh, uh, so he's really here to talk about what his job entails, what he hopes to achieve, what he has achieved. He's going to show a nine-minute video of uh, some of the projects that uh, he has uh, set in motion, he and his team. Um, he will then do a PowerPoint, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Uh, so with that, uh, David is going to come and do his presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, it's it's an honor to be here, and, and thank you, Peter, and thank you the to the to the foundation for for providing for hosting today. Um, I, uh, I I suspect that most in the audience and and whether here in the room or or from one of the cameras watching what we're doing uh, still remember where they were on September 11th, 2001, when they heard that two towers had been hit by two aircraft. I certainly remember, uh, and I was uh, I was in a traffic jam in Virginia. Uh, uh, the first call came from CNN, where I was then national security correspondent, and the second call came from my wife, and she said, uh, I'll never forget the way she put it. She said, uh, uh, these two towers have been hit, do you know that? And I said, yes. She said, I think it's your people. And I said, I, I, re I, reg I, reg I regret, uh, that's, that's the wrong tone. <laughs> um, but she had a point. Uh, I had spent much of the summer, because my job was national security, hearing from uh, sources in U.S. intelligence, one who is prominently remembered to have had his hair on fire all summer, uh, very worried about the uh, intelligence suggesting that the United States might be attacked, uh, some U.S. So uh, target might be attacked um, uh, by, with, ter with, a, with a major terrorist attack. And of course it did come to pass. Um, and it, that sort of leads to where I am now and why I'm there. Um, I think it was that summer of uh, watching the um, information that led then, unfortunately, to attack that, an attack that no one could predict the shape or timing of, um, that made me uh, so convinced that we that what we're doing in Afghanistan is very important and that we must persist. We must, we must continue. We must have some patience. Uh, so I am not a typical diplomat. I, um, I'm not a foreign service officer. I spent 32 years as a journalist at, uh, at NPR and, and ABC News and CNN, and that's my background, um, and I'm proud of it. Uh, but I also uh, care a lot about what we're doing in Afghanistan and volunteered some time as a sort of civilian um, volunteer, if you will. I've been in Kabul for um, ten and a half months now and expect to be there for a bit, bit longer. Um, and I think we are beginning to make a difference with some of the programs that, um, that we've started since I arrived. Uh, we, um, probably the best way though, because I'm a TV guy, uh, is to start by showing a little bit of tape. Um, I think pictures are stronger than words. So. If, if we've got the technology to do that it lined up, do we? Can we roll that, uh, that video segment, please? Even, with, right. even without a war, public diplomacy in Afghanistan's harsh, rugged terrain was never going to be easy. But with about 100,000 American troops in the country, Afghans need to know that there are civilians here, too. Assalamualaikum. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great day to be in Afghanistan. Ambassador Eikenberry is the face of America in Afghanistan. Most people who see him on the street recognize him immediately. For every uh, one uh, piece of bad news that comes from Afghanistan, I'll tell you there's 100 pieces of good news. In Kabul, we have all the classic public diplomacy efforts, but we do them on steroids. Fulbright scholarships have almost doubled this year. preserve and save the famous Sarat Citadel. But it's not easy 
We're up against a media-driven perception among many in the West that Afghanistan is all about death and destruction. Welcome to Kandahar City Hall. Concertina wire, blast walls, and body armor. With serious journalists like CNN's Jill Doherty, we are sometimes able to show the other side. It's called Cash for Work, an American-sponsored program to help these women, most of them widows, survive. Public support is a key issue for the press section. A new partner nation outreach team organizes visits by journalists from troop-contributing nations and sends articulate young Afghans to Europe to make their case. The people in Afghanistan, they're really thankful to this, their support and to the sacrifices that they have made in our country. Uh, Afghanistan is on the road to progress, but we still need their support and we don't want them to leave us alone right now. Our main audience, though, the Afghan people. And here, classic public diplomacy is not enough. On Tolo TV, the cop thriller Eagle 4 has garnered a loyal audience. Afghanistan's fast-growing army is another target for strategic communications. The show will air in Dari and Pashto starting in late spring. It is here that a new, dedicated, professional defense force is emerging. This is the place for the birth of an army. And then there is radio. In a nation that has low literacy, where television's reach is mostly just the cities, it has the greatest impact. We've invested in Afghan talent. And some of that Afghan talent is taking educational storytelling on the road. Another major effort involves helping the Afghan government to better communicate with its people. The Government Media Information Center trains ministers, governors, government spokesmen, the world first saw its new capabilities at the Kabul conference in July. Yes, I hear you. So this conference makes it clear the world is with Afghanistan and the world stands in opposition to the common threat and the common enemy that stalks us all. One of the most important new efforts reaches out to key tribal and religious leaders. Exchange programs to take Afghan mullahs to other Muslim countries and to the United States. Key American visitors coming here. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is Imam Johari. I am an Imam from Washington, D.C., where we have over 3,000 Muslims worshipping every Jumu'ah from 37 different languages. I'm grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that students from the Muslim countries like yours have come to America and were free to make dawah to me that now. I am a Muslim, one of the eight million Muslims in America. An important statistic, 65% of Afghans are 25 or younger. We will be bringing Sesame Street here soon for the youngest Afghans to be translated from Arabic. The cell phone is currently revolutionizing communications here. Some people would rather go hungry than give up their mobile phone. From 10,000 phones four years ago to over 10 million today. We are funding tower construction and other efforts to help commercial carriers reach more Afghans more of the time. And we are helping Afghan broadcasters to revive the rich musical traditions that the Taliban once banned.
Music. It gives people hope. So there's a little video flavor. Um, and, and now I'd like to uh, set out for you some of the um, initiatives that we're working on uh, using a PowerPoint presentation. And here it is. Um, let's see. Yeah, I wanted to start with, I don't know how legible that is, but I'll read it out. Um, I wanted to start sort of responding in a way to some of the assumptions that, um, that, I, that I read and hear many hold about Afghanistan. And all of these assumptions have merit. There's, there's basis in fact for each of them. Uh, but I think that some of them are assumed too, uh, too comfortably to be entirely true. Uh, living in Afghanistan for uh, uh, as long as I have, uh, you know, corruption, absolutely, there's, there's a good deal of it. There's a good deal of it in Afghanistan, just as there is in, in the neighboring countries in that region. It is a very real problem. It is something the embassy worries about and works on every day. But uh, so is the optimism of the younger generation in Afghanistan. And this is a country that is 66 percent under the age of 25, or 25 or younger. Uh, people of that age are predisposed to optimism. Um, they are the key demographic for the country. They are, I mean, it's trite to say they're the future. They're, they're actually not just the future, they're the present. Um, we are working on that. Many of our programs are aimed at that demographic group. And they do think differently uh, than their parents' generation. There is hope in the way they think. Uh, and we want to encourage them to have hope. We're also doing a lot of things. Uh, one example here. Uh, another part of the embassy is working very hard to help Afghanistan have its own FBI. And that, uh, that group, while it has its problems, while it sometimes gets stopped in its work by, uh, by others in the government, has nonetheless uh, arrested, tried, and sentenced several corrupt high-level officials and shows real promise. That's just one example. Uh, is the country fragmented along ethnic lines? Well, it's certainly multi-ethnic. And there are certainly tribal tensions and even fighting and killing sometimes. All of that's very true. You can't deny it. Uh, but the country has, since 1747, been, had, had, had the same boundaries it has now and the same sense of Afghan nationhood. And it's real. If you live there, Afghans are proud of being Afghans. Um, th they don't want to be Pakistanis. They don't want to be anything else. They, there is a sense of national identity that practically every Afghan you meet makes very clear. Uh, there are also institutions emerging, like the Afghan National Army, that are increasingly popular, uh, that are multi-ethnic, and that I think are the hope for the future of the country, which is why we're doing that documentary. We're, we're, we're helping to pay for that, that documentary, which is kind of actually a reality TV series that will be broadcasting starting in spring about the Afghan army. It's an institution that's already popular. We'd like to make it much more so. And we'd like to show people that, in fact, it's becoming quite an effective institution. I go out to the training uh, centers sometimes to see the filming and to talk to the people who are working on it. Uh, and they tell me, and these are documentarians who won awards doing uh, films on, on other armies in the past, um, that uh, uh, a, a non-commissioned officer class is beginning to emerge in the Afghan army that is worthy of the name. Master sergeants, they are the key. Uh, and they are beginning to appear in the, in the Afghan army, which is, you know, tremendous attention and money and resources are being spent on that institution. Um, but it is beginning to show. And obviously the government is structured in such a way as to, uh, to try to minimize the, the, the ethnic tensions, although they are very real. Um, sometimes people say there's been little economic development since the fall of the Taliban. Well, there certainly hasn't been enough. Nobody's satisfied. But... Uh, at least in the area I work, in the communications field, there's actually been quite a bit of progress, and it has had a pretty dramatic effect. Uh, there were 10,000 cell phone users in 2002. There are uh, between 10 and 15 million today, 15 million different chips. Um, sometimes people have several. So uh, that's, why the, that's why the disparity between 10 and 15. But the cell phone is revolutionizing Afghanistan just as it has so many other countries around the world. It's changing the way people think. It's making them feel more, uh, more confident. It's making them feel safer. Um, 
and we, we are working to try, particularly with our military colleagues, to try and, and increase that, increase the coverage, increase the, uh, the, amount, the time of day that it's, that it's on, and so forth. It's, it's a very key project. And, an, and the other area I work in is, of course, radio and television, where, uh, according to the latest survey uh, uh, done by Altai Consulting, there are now 175 radio and 75 separate television stations, and I'm talking uh, about separate entities. In other words, in some cases, uh, one entity will have several licenses. I'm not counting that. There are this many broadcasters. Now, you know, they vary. <laughs> some of them are pretty ropey, pretty basic. Some of them, are, you know, are warlord TV, basically. But there are some very, very good journalists in Afghanistan. And a Afghans seem to take to the idea of a free media. Uh, and they're using it in ways that I, I think almost all of us who who've had our careers in journalism are quite excited about. So it, it's a green shoot. It needs, it needs tending it, 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 to grow into a tree, but it's definitely on its way. Uh, and then obviously uh, we are building our, our Afghan colleagues with us, with our money, are building uh, thousands of kilometers of roads every year. Uh, there's a new Afghan-Pakistan transit trade agreement. Uh, so th these kinds of things are changing the picture for the average Afghan who tends to be in the farming business uh, and wants to be able to get crops to market. So, you know, uh, like pomegranates, for example, as I mentioned at the top. So sure, there's a lot, there is a lot of bad news, and it's a very mixed picture. But um, there are some pretty positive things happening uh, in economic development as well. Uh, the old graveyard of empires argument, um, I mean, as I say here, it, it, you know, what empire? <laughs> there are, uh, are 40,000 non-American troops from 45 countries, including Muslim nations, uh, serving in Afghanistan. And I think maybe sometimes in Washington we sort of forget about them because on our news we only see the Americans. But believe me, when I go around the country, I'm working and dealing with Lithuanians and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Frenchmen, uh, Italians in Herat. Uh, we work closely with them and they with us. And, and it is, it is this, what makes this strong is the coalition. Uh, the fact that the, the, the Afghans, when you talk to them, they don't usually talk, some of them do, but most of them don't, talk about American troops. They talk about coalition troops. And, and they ask, is the world going to desert us, or will they stick with us? The world. And, you know, that's, that's the way the majority of them see it. And every poll I've ever seen uh, indicates that Afghans uh, do not want the U.S. and its allies to leave too soon. Uh, they, they, uh, they're counting on help for some years to come. Uh, I, I was, was recruited by this gentleman to come and do this job. And um, uh, obviously, like I'm sure many others, so much regret his, his, his early passing. Uh, but I, I believe Richard Holbrook was right that we are not going to win this war if we cede the airwaves to people who present themselves as false messengers, and that we need a strategic communications plan uh, for Afghanistan, that communications are absolutely critical, and that this is a, a battle of perceptions. So that, that, is, that is the sort of uh, mandate that we are trying to uh, follow through on. Uh, I lead the, the section of the embassy that I lead uh, had, an, had a budget in 2008 of $1.2 million. Our current budget is $114 million. Um, a very dramatic increase in resources, and, uh, and I think an appropriate one. And now I'm going to try to lay out for you some of the ways in which we're trying to make those resources make a difference. Uh, some programs are already well underway. Uh, we've, we funded a substantial amount of radio programming. I thought when I went to Afghanistan that I'd be kind of building the NPR of Afghanistan, a lot of radio stations. Um, I, I didn't realize how, many, how much work had already been done. There, there really are a lot of radio and television stations. May, there are some pockets here and there where, where the service isn't good, and we've, we've helped a few uh, new broadcasters. But for the most part, what there isn't enough of is good Afghan-produced content, interesting programming. 
So we're, uh, uh, in the first period of time that we've been working, we've been uh, trying to uh, invest in Afghan talent in the area of programming. And there's a lot of it, happily. So we've got some very interesting uh, productions. Uh, you know, when, if you turn on television in the afternoon in Afghanistan, uh, you tend to see Indian soap operas. And people love soap operas, and that's fine, but how about some Afghan ones? Uh, the programs like Eagle Four that you just saw a clip of, where um, the actors are Afghan, the, the story is Afghan, the producers, the directors, the, it's all Afghan, and it's filmed in Kabul, are, are, are hugely more popular than something produced uh, uh, on the Indian subcontinent. So uh, we, we're working in that area where we've, uh, you saw in the, in the clip, uh, we've, we've uh, experimented with open air traveling theater with messages about, about tolerance, about uh, uh, against drug use, uh, um, about uh, respecting women and women's rights. Um, and we've opened some of the, um, so we, we're opening a lot more Lincoln Learning Centers, which are these kind of libraries down on the right-hand side there that, that also are basically internet cafes uh, and are empowering a lot of Afghan young people to dream about something larger than their, their village or their town or their, their current possibilities. Um, we also spent $1.2 million uh, of the Ambassador's Fund on the restoration, and here you see it restored, of the Herat Citadel, which is a very visible symbol of, of Afghan pride seen by almost everyone in the city because it's up on a hill. Um, and we're looking for other projects like that. I, I've come to believe that cultural preservation is strategic communications if it's done right and if people are told about it. Um, we're sort of focusing on areas of national pride, whether it's the army or the Herat Citadel. Uh, and trying to help uh, enhance them. I mentioned Eagle Four and the other clip and Birth of, Ar of an Army Here's two, and Sesame Street, but we, are, we have an SMS program where we are um, called Paywast, uh, which, which is a program where we are paying for basically 80 million messages. Uh, it amounts to, uh, I hope I'm not violating copyright here, it's basically Twitter for Afghanistan uh, in the sense that it is a social media uh, product, which we, we contracted out and this company won the bidding, um, where people can, anyone with a cell phone can set up a social group. Uh, for example, if, you're, uh, if you sell fruit in the Kandahar market and you want the farmers in the surrounding area to know what it is you're offering for melons at 4 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon, you can send out a, a message and the, the 120 farmers who you want to reach, if they if they, by word of mouth, hear about this, they'll get the price instantaneously and then they can make better decisions uh, about when to harvest their melons. Is it this week or will next week the prices maybe be better? So it's a tool we hope will help small businesses and farmers and, uh, to, to just do a little better and communicate uh, and, and use communications profitably. Once the 80 million messages run out, the, uh, this company and the four phone companies will together are working now. They've they've settled on some some you know some costs, a small charge. What we're clearly the number of people using it will drop way down once it isn't free anymore. But we're hoping that there'll be a sustainable group who find that this is a this is a useful tool for them. Uh, cultural affairs. We've we've as mentioned we've. We're greatly increasing the exchange programs, the, the standard, the classics, like the Fulbright program. Uh, we would increase it even further if we could find enough candidates who could, who could, uh, who could pass the exams. But we're, we're going to keep aggressively trying to find uh, new, new Afghan Fulbright scholars. And we're up to 60 for 2011. The International Visitors Program, it has doubled in the last two years. We, we're coming up with new types, new ideas of groups that we'd like to have come. Uh, people with particular specialties and interests that could benefit. Uh, we'll be bringing a lot of local government officials in groups here. We'll be bringing uh, religious groups, and uh, and we think that's very very useful. Um, in the film, you saw you heard a little bit of Imam Johari. He was just kind of a, a bit of a rock star uh, when he came to visit um, uh, Afghanistan recently. 
uh, we're working aggressively to find others like him who, um, who are articulate, who are charismatic, and who are American, and who are Muslim, uh, to spread the message to Afghans, uh, many of whom don't seem to realize we have Muslims in this country, and they do pretty well. And uh, that this, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this message, this, this is a tolerant country, and, and uh, we're not against Muslims. So I, 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 more, the, 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 more, the longer I'm there, the more I believe in the person-to-person, face-to-face exchanges of this kind. Uh, we have a lot of plans in that area. Um, the way forward includes a lot more attention to something we're already doing, which is the Government Media Information Center, uh, headquartered in Kabul with a satellite office in Kandahar. Uh, they hosted 202 press conferences uh, in the last year, and they are the primary platform for the Afghan government to communicate uh, with its people these days. They're doing a, doing a terrific job uh, training spokesmen, helping ministers and governors to, to find the right voice, the right way to talk, and to be more proactive about getting out there and explaining their story. Um, we have plans to open uh, GMIC uh, satellite offices, or we don't have plans, the Afghans have plans, and they have told us where they want them, too. There are five or six more of them that they want to open uh, over the next year or two, and uh, we, are, we are helping them in any way we can, mostly with money, uh, but with advice as well. Uh, there's a new security news desk at GMIC, where, which, has, which is staffed with uh, not only the, um, the Ministry of Defense, Afghan Ministry of Defense and Ministry of Interior personnel, but also people from ISAF and from, from kind of the, 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 uh, the international forces. And it's a one-stop shopping place for journalists to go if something happens, if, if an IED goes off and they want to hear uh, our, our side's understanding of what actually happened. Uh, they're trying to be quicker at responding to uh, some of the uh, lies, for the most part, that are put out by the other side. Cultural heritage and preservation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I, I, I really, the, more, the longer I'm there, the more I believe in this as, a, as, a, as something around which Afghans can coalesce and be proud. Uh, it, the country has a, a, a deep history going back many, many centuries. Uh, it's extraordinary what the kinds of things that are being excavated uh, out of the ground in, in Afghanistan today. This, these pictures here, Masina were taken uh, at, at, uh, at Einach, which, which is a sort of 5th to 7th century Buddhist uh, uh, center of, of civilization. And this is the stupa, which is the religious um, temple. Uh, and it's, it, it happens to be on top of, a, of, of the second largest copper reserves in the country. So we've been working hard um, with our our Chinese colleagues, because it's a Chinese company that will be doing the copper mining, with the Afghan government first and foremost, to, to try to assure that um, it can be a win-win. In other words, that uh, archaeology, appropriate archaeology can be done, that time can be allowed for that, and then that, that, that the copper mining can also occur because those jobs are, are so, so badly needed by the country. Down below, the Herat minarets um, were a special favorite of Ambassador Holbrooks. He he wanted to make sure they were they were saved. Uh, right now, there's a um, uh, a sort of uh, four lane highway going right through the middle of them, and they are shaken every time a diesel truck goes through. Um, but fortunately, uh, uh, the Afghan Minister of Information and Culture, Minister Rahin, is very very aware of the problem. He and other ministers have been uh, working to try to solve it. And we have been quietly helping um, uh, in any way we can. Uh, there's going to be a bypass road construct. Well, it's already been a lot of the houses have already been condemned and paid for. And there's a bypass road basically uh, in preparation, which will take the traffic out from there. Once it is out, uh, it'll be possible to um, for for UNESCO to come in and and do some of the work that needs to be done to make sure that these important symbols, uh, you know, are are remain for many more years. So we're doing a lot. We're going we're gonna to try to uh, help the National Museum in Afghanistan, which is wonderful, but woefully underfunded and under-equipped and, frankly, needs practically everything, including a new roof. 
um, we're going to be looking at a, at a major program to help them, and we're going to also try to have a, an event where we reach out to the international community and hopefully get some contributions from, from, uh, from others as well. Uh, we educational and English language programs. Uh, here I'm talking really about two things. Uh, one is English language. When I got to Kabul, uh, we were spending, well, Mary Blocker's in the audience, and she may know better, but I think it was about half a million dollars on English language training of one kind or another in, in, uh, in Afghanistan. Um, I, I, we have a wonderful, uh, very experienced and seasoned guy now running these programs. And I've given him $10 million and said, let's make a difference. And he's doing uh, remarkable things. I think, you know, this is something that will take a little while. This is not quick and shallow like a TV show. Uh, but the outcome will be hundreds of thousands of Afghans with a, with a marketable skill and a, and a way to, uh, to interact with the rest of the world. It's just, that's deep stuff. That's useful stuff. The other half of this slide, I guess, would be the, um, we're spending quite a lot of money this year on uh, uh, getting constructed uh, some, some media centers at major, major universities, starting with Kabul and Herat. Um, these are uh, state-of-the-art buildings that contain a, a working radio station, a working television studio without a license. The station does have a license, and a printing press. And uh, th these are facilities for uh, the journalism departments of major uh, Afghan universities to start training that next generation of journalists that are going to be so critical to to Afghanistan's future, we hope and believe. And we're also setting up partnerships with American universities. Um, University of Nebraska Omaha is going to be the partner of Kabul University's journalism department, and they, of course, have uh, a deep background in Afghan studies, so they're in a particularly appropriate choice for that role. Traditional communications, uh, well, uh, another way to put it, this would be to say it's, it, and I, again, I'm, the longer I'm there, the more convinced I am we must do this and we must do more of it, and the Afghans need to do more of it and we need to help them. And that is uh, we, we, need, we need to reach out to uh, tribal and religious leaders in Afghanistan. We need to empower moderate voices among them in any way that we can find. And we need to give them a chance to, be, to resume their rightful place in the global discussion among Muslims about what is their faith? What does it stand for? What's its way forward? Um, I think by one of, the, one of the ill effects of the Taliban um, was that they were isolated. They were cut off from that discussion. And, and a very um, extreme and uh, in many ways false vision of Islam was, was imposed instead. Uh, and in a country that is, um, where literacy is very low, uh, people don't actually know what the Quran actually does say on some issues. So uh, this is a, a, a really important area. Now, I'm not Muslim, and we're not seen as a Muslim nation, although we have a lot of prominent Muslims among us. Um, and we're not, we can't lecture to people on this subject. Uh, it's none of our business, actually. All we can do is, is enable discussions among Muslims. So we're doing things like organizing uh, with, with USIP, we're organizing a program for 100 Afghan mullahs to travel to, uh, to Egypt for several weeks, to Indonesia for several weeks, and to the United States, and have discussions about topics of mutual interest with, um, with, with imams from those countries. Um, we're not dictating what the conversations will be. It's, it, again, not our business. But it is, our, it is important for us, it's in our national security interest that those discussions start to occur. So that's one example. We're looking at quite a few other programs of a similar nature, taking people out. And we're also uh, uh, working to set up a uh, distinguished Islamic speaker series to try to bring interesting speakers to Afghanistan and then clearly uh, make sure that their events, their speeches are promoted and, and uh, that they're broadcast and that people hear about them. Very important area. Um, this is too, though. Um, we're, we're, 
As I mentioned, the demographics drive us in a youthful direction, a lot, drive a lot of our money and our effort in a youthful direction. And we're uh, working with an NGO to identify uh, sites in a number of major cities where we could uh, have them construct uh, sports fields and sports facilities, uh, locker rooms, and some indoor sports space too because that is basically, to be frank, the only place women can play sports safely in Afghanistan. So volleyball courts, basketball courts that can be used by either gender are, are really a, a, a a valuable thing, and we're going to try to do that in at least several, if not five or six, major cities as one of our key projects. I'm also, as, a, as an old TV guy, um, I, I kind of believe in sports broadcasting um, and, uh, and, and in sports as, as a unifying factor. Um, so we're uh, working to get uh, sports broadcasting trucks built that are suitable for the Afghan market. They have to be rugged, they have to be um, not too complex, um, but equipment that will allow Afghans to watch Afghan teams playing each other live on television with instant replay and the whole deal, um, and I hope create some excitement. Um, I know that in other countries, uh, this model, you know, if TV comes first and then pretty soon the banks want their names on the T-shirts and so forth, it, it could become a sustainable model and it's worth a try. And obviously it's targeted at uh, young men more than anybody else. And they're a key demographic for us. The parliament came to us and said, we have, uh, we wonder if you would be willing to help us to, uh, to get ourselves into the 21st century in terms of equipment so that, we c it's so, that so that our sessions can be easily broadcast. I mean, here we are on C-SPAN. They basically want C-SPAN there, um, and we're trying to help them do that. Um, by uh, We've got a, a contract with, with a, a very respected broadcasting company, uh, which we hope to finalize very soon, to, uh, to have them put in robot cameras, because right now this, this chamber is full of a cacophony of journalists, and they're all over the place, and the, the, the legislators say it's too much for them. Uh, so it'll be a mobile cam, uh, robocam system where you can just plug in and you get a feed, m much as much as the U.S. Congress has now. Um, we're also looking uh, with another uh, grantee at, at developing an FM radio station that would belong to the Parliament. That would just be in Kabul. Uh, this is another initiative that we started uh, uh, not too long ago that's already bearing fruit, and that is, uh, of course, we're the embassy to Afghanistan, uh, not anywhere else. But because of the war, that, uh, the struggle that's going on right now, there is a need that Afghans have to be able to reach out to the countries that are contributing troops and speak to them and um, give an Afghan perspective on the importance of that and on the importance of their civilian efforts. So uh, we're trying to help with a small team to arrange those kinds of conversations. Uh, the team uh, is planning uh, to help host nine media tours to Afghanistan. This is media tours by journalists from countries that have troops there. And, and the emphasis of these tours is to take people around to uh, some of the civilian projects that the Afghan government is doing, or sometimes with our help, sometimes with someone else's help, but trying to show th these journalists that there is more than blood and guts to what's going on in Afghanistan. Uh, we, and as, I, as you saw in the clip that I showed earlier, we're also organizing um, for articulate Afghan spokesmen of one kind or another to, to go on speaking tours to some of these countries. Uh, the one that you saw, the young lady that, that, who spoke in the clip earlier, was invited to the, to the House of Lords and testified before a committee on, on women's rights while she was there. And they also were on the BBC and they were also, uh, you know, uh, meeting with an NGO uh, and they did this not only in the UK but in Italy. This is this is a picture at an Italian university. They were they were wildly successful, uh, and I think, you know, again, it's not our job to to tell our allies why it's important that they're there. It's the Afghans' job to say why they want these countries to stay for a while, please. Uh, and it's so much better when they do. So we're trying to help them do that because they don't have the means themselves. We're also organizing, we had one recently, we had a Pakistani media tour recently, and we also had an Arab media tour a 
coming into Afghanistan. I, I talked to both groups, and we're going to do more of that. Uh, that obviously, those uh, uh, some of the Arab countries are in fact on the ground with troops, so they're they're very important. Um, that's basically my presentation, uh, and and I come back to the point where I started, which is that, you know. To cut a long story short, the president is right. We are in Afghanistan because of 9-11, uh, and it is still not safe for us to reduce our effort. Uh, and it will take some time. Uh, at Lisbon, the president uh, and the other leaders decided to uh, maintain uh, uh, combat troops at, at least till 2014. That was an excellent call, in my view. Uh, but I, you know, your questions may bring this out, and I should be honest and, and end by saying, you know, th this, things are not all going well in Afghanistan. This is very, very tough work. Um, and it is not assured that we will end up with a good situation. Um, it is going to require perseverance. It is going to require time. I guess the main point of my presentation is it's not impossible. It's quite doable. And there are, there are many pieces of evidence that I see and have seen over the 10 months that I've been there um, that this country, the, that Afghanistan can pull itself together, not to be, um, you know, uh, Switzerland, but to be a, a, a workable state with some sense of forward motion and some sense of hope. And that's what that country needs. Thanks very much. I'll be happy to take your questions. from Afghan Embassy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Peter. Um, nice to see you. Uh, do you agree with me that we all failed in public opinion? We, American friends, European and Afghan, uh, failing in public opinion definitely it is not only that you would focus in Kabul. I think your media in Washington is not showing that much about Afghanistan. We've got a lot of Afghan community diaspora that they are influencing the entire crisis there in Kabul in Afghanistan, every part. So I think that part would not be successful, what you do. That is a great effort, what you do, if you would not bridge it with Washington and also with other friends and allies and that their, their front page of their medias are nothing about Afghanistan. Everything is negative. So I think it is the, the proper timing that all the achievements you've done, the efforts, at least bring it back to the media that we need to do it, both sides, not only their folks in Afghanistan, but here which is very important. The money goes, private sector send money, and they need to understand that this mission is what about, and this mission should be defined properly. That this is not what you say right, Afghanistan, there is no lack of courage in Afghanistan. There is a lack of resources and training. And, and the image that now the international community has there among Afghans, this is like, you do us a favor. You do not do the favor to Afghans versus you you are there because of the safety of New York and European streets. So this image should come from both sides, not only there that you're focusing in Afghanistan. I believe part of my job is also in Washington. Uh, is very difficult um, when I see that most of the people, they do not understand at all the mission of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. they, they, the, the language they use, they're not well informed. Even our leaders, they're using the wrong terms, which are very sensitive about our culture like the words mentor, coach, and all these stuffs, which would give completely different meaning in our culture. It's not a playground. So all these sensitive words would be also entitled that at least would make kind of strategy to be our politicians, your politicians also would consider. Thank you. Okay, just to summarize the question then for, I mean, so you're doing all this great work in Afghanistan, but it's not being communicated to the American public who has turned against the war. Yeah, well, that's why I'm standing here uh, uh, today to try and start communicating about what we're doing. Um, I think we're, we're making some, some difference. I think we're going to make a lot of difference before we're done. 
uh, and I do want uh, the taxpayers who are paying for it to know that, at least in my view, as the humble public servant who's trying to trying to lead this effort in within the embassy context under the leadership of Ambassador Eikenberry, I think the money is worth it. I think it's making a difference, um, and I think we need to persevere at it. Uh, on the question of public opinion in the West, well, I did talk about the Partnership Nation outreach effort we're making, but we do we are the embassy to Afghanistan, and our focus primarily, 98 percent, is on the Afghan people. Um, I'm very cognizant of the of the fallen in support uh, for the troops and for what we're trying to do in Afghanistan. I'm very worried about it. Again, that's why I'm standing here. Um, but I, well, I, th I think our leaders have made some good calls lately. Um, I obviously believe in the leadership or I wouldn't have joined the government. Um, and, you know, I think we've got some time now to get this right. Um, in terms of the media, well, you know, I, I'm not going to be a, a media basher. I, I could hardly be after 32 years in the business. Um, I, I love the business that I spent most of my life in. I believe in it. But let's be honest. You know, uh, if, if, if something blows up in, in Kabul, that's news. If three schools open in Kabul, that is not news. It may be more important, actually, in the long term, but it's not news, the way news, the news business runs. And you, you can't blame reporters for that or, or editors because in the 32 years I was in the business, I saw many pieces of data making quite clear that while people think they don't want to see negative news all the time, in fact, that is what they watch. That is what people are interested in so, so, or read about. You know, uh, If everything's fine, why report? You know? so, so we're up against a sort of structural problem in a way as we try to tell the message that things are not so bad in Afghanistan, that some really good things are happening, that if there's a bit of patience, it'll be okay, you know, because that doesn't sound like a news story. But it's very true, and I think that if we reach out to in, in, in as many ways and in imagine, imaginative ways as we can confine, we can get it across to the American people and the other countries that have contributed blood and treasure to this effort. Oh, in the back. Uh, on the left. Thank you. Dominic Chilcott from the British Embassy. I'm interested in how you measure um, the effects of uh, the activities that you're doing um, and, how you're, um, and how you're able to satisfy yourself when you do your evaluation that uh, the progress that you sort of feel almost anecdotally and through watching the events is actually taking place uh, within Afghan society. Could you say something about evaluation? It's a difficult question because this, this kind of work is highly subjective, to be honest. And, and, and I, I'll be honest and stand here and tell you, I'm, I'm using my, I, I have long experience in this area, but I'm using my instincts more than anything else, based on that experience, to try to figure out what I think will be effective. Um, we are, however, uh, we are planning to uh, fund a study. We're going to get outside help to tell us whether, which of our programs are working well. And I'm very keen on, you know, being nimble. Um, we, we, we've, we, we put out uh, a lot of different efforts, and it's important to, you know, when you see something's working, plus it up. When you see something isn't working, close it down. Save that money for something else. We're trying to be nimble and do that. Um, how do we measure? Uh, I, you know, I can't resist saying to you that I think that if, uh, um, I think that if police recruiting is up in the period after Eagle Four finishes running, um, I think we, we probably will be able to claim a little bit of credit for that. So there are ways like that of, of at least pointing to differences, concrete differences that, that certain programs may make. But you put your finger on a very difficult problem. It's, it's, and it's, you know, it's, it, I don't have the answer, all the answers. But I think we will do some monitoring. Obviously, we can check a lot of things. Did the show broadcast, you know? Or did the SMS program work? These are checkable facts, and that we are doing. Hi, I'm Joel Rayburn from uh, New American National Defense University, uh, late of ISAF. Um, you you illustrated in your uh, in your contrast between uh, news coverage of uh, of a bombing versus opening of schools, uh, the counterinsurgent uh, the counterinsurgent strategic communications conundrum, which is a perverse one. 
which is that the insurgents tend to cause the vast majority of the violence and civilian casualties, but the counterinsurgents are blamed for the lack of security in the country. So uh, with a budget of over $100 million, but facing a very media-savvy adversary, the Taliban, who, who did not appear directly in your, in your presentation necessarily. But w what are you able to do with your budget uh, to, to try and, and beat them in a punch-counterpunch uh, of perceptions about uh, the level of insecurity and mm -hmm. particular bombing attacks and, and so on? And, well, civilian, and civilian casualties in particular. Yeah, I mean, you put your finger on a very important uh, uh, issue in communications in Afghanistan. It is one that I would say uh, is the primarily, primary concern of General Petraeus and, and Admiral Smith and others who are working uh, on, the, on our, our military partners. Um, and they do work on that. They do try to respond quickly to, uh, particularly when there are lies about civilian casualties. And they do try to, and they are, uh, I know General Petraeus has put a renewed emphasis uh, recently since he's come in uh, on, on stressing and making public uh, in any way possible when large-scale civilian casualties are caused by the Taliban. Um, but, you know, there's a debate internally about how effective is that. I've talked to some of my Afghan staff who say, I hate to tell you this, say this to me, I hate to tell you this, but um, you, you don't get much traction uh, telling, blaming the Taliban for, for civilian casualties. In the end, people just, um, just think, well, it's because you're here and they're fighting you and it's the way, it, it's the way warfare is. They don't, it's very difficult to kind of blame, put the blame on the Taliban in a forceful way, although I know my military colleagues are working uh, in, some way, in some interesting new ways to, to try to do that. Um, for our part, I think I think on the civilian side, our major effort has to be not just to respond tit for tat each time, but to change the ground on which we're all walking, change the communication space in Afghanistan, broaden it, uh, and deepen it. So helping to expand the cell phone coverage, uh, helping to make the, uh, uh, the television and radio signals of television and radio stations that we think are sensible and, and, and reasonable uh, stronger and reaching more people, um, you know, we're, that's changing the space within which the Taliban also has to operate. People tell me how effective the Taliban propaganda is and how worried I must be. I have to tell you, when I look at polling data at how popular the Taliban is, I'm not so sure that's true. Uh, they're not popular. They're hated and feared uh, by most of the population. Um, but, but, they're, but they're very effective in some ways, too. Uh, fear being one of their tools, of course. But uh, you know, they're they're good. They're very quick on the internet. They're very quick with. They've got some magazine publications they put out that look mm, sort of slick, actually. Um, one uh, one of the ministers in the government brought me one and said, you know, my stuff's not as good as this. What can we do about it? So he and I are working on that. And uh, his ministry, we're going to help his ministry to plus up their capabilities and put out better looking publications that are a little clearer and you know more attractive and have better color pictures in them and so forth. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not brain surgery, but we're, we're very actively uh, trying to help the Afghans to figure out how to respond to some of these, these Taliban propaganda. Hi, uh, Brian Merrill, DOD. Um, you mentioned uh, that you work a little bit with, uh, with ISAF and, and whatnot. Um, I noticed there's nobody from ISAF on the, on the list here. Uh, do you work with uh, Sija Potif and their forward media teams? Because they do a lot of uh, polling and they, they gauge the effects of some of their efforts. So, uh, it, how yes. much feedback do you get with that? We, we, we work very closely with them. Uh, we have an interagency uh, uh, telecommunications group that meets every week. We have, uh, we have a lot of different fora in which we, we work together. We're working together on some projects uh, you know, that, that we're both funding. Um, I meet with Admiral Smith every week. I mean, we're, we're very much in partnership. We, have, we, come at, we come at the problem somewhat differently, a different perspective. I mean, there's going to be an embassy there forever, I hope. Um, and we have to have relationships with those minist ministries, whether we like the incumbents or not. Um, so you know, our perspective is a little different sometimes, but, but um, there's plenty of goodwill and plenty of common work going on. 
Thank you. Uh, Glenn Carl, I was a national intelligence officer several years ago for terrorism. You uh, quoted President uh, Obama saying that we have to remember why we're there, which is to uh, go after al-Qaeda and make sure that they cannot strike against the United States or Western interests. Are we not in danger of having confused the Taliban uh, ethnic uh, uh, divergences and problems there with the problem of the Taliban and therefore uh, made uh, nation building and uh, counterinsurgency uh, the response to what's a terrorist problem? Well, you know, this is a little outside of my area, but I would just say this. Uh, if, if the Taliban want to change the, the nature of the discussion, they could publicly state, they could publicly forswear al-Qaeda. Uh, they haven't. I'd love to see them do it. And it probably would change the nature of our deliberations, um, we and our allies, if they were to do that. But they haven't. Um, I guess that's the only comment I can offer on that, really. Um, as long as the Taliban does not um, denounce al-Qaeda and we're left with the uh, situation as it is now, I think we have to be worried about the prospect of the Taliban ever coming back to power in Afghanistan. Very worried, actually. I'm Jim Landers of the Dallas Morning News. Could you talk a little bit more about what you're up against? How do the Taliban communicate with the Afghan civilian population? Well, uh, there are, as I mentioned, there's everything from, uh, by local standards, slick publications uh, that are printed. I th I'm, I'm not really sure where they're printed, actually, but they're not printed in Afghanistan. But I know that people in Afghanistan help write them. Everything from that sort of thing to, to night letters on people's doors, threatening them and warning them to stop working for the Afghan government. Uh, a wide variety of different communications tools. And, uh, you know, f fear is obviously, as I mentioned, one of their uh, most effective tools, but they have, they have others. Um, and, you know, let, let, let's be honest, uh, the Afghan government is still, you know, uh, kind of a nascent effort. <laughs> um, Afghans are eager for justice. They want to have a system, a fair system, and that's a work in progress. And um, so when, their percept when there's a perception that, that uh, the rule of law is not strong, uh, that's a tool the Taliban can use. Um, so, you know, it's, it's difficult. It's certainly not a black and white situation. Actually, just a quick follow-up yeah. to that, yeah. David. I mean, uh, on the other side of the border in Pakistan, the Taliban had a pretty effective set of radio uh, stations, which they were sort of, tra you know, relatively small transmission areas, but they were very mobile and cost very little. Do they have something similar in Afghanistan, or is that kind of being taken down, or how, how, do, how are they communicating locally, on, on, since radio is the best form of trans... Uh, there, are, there are small radio broadcasts that pop up. Uh, sometimes they're in a van. I, I gather even there was one once that was on a bicycle, uh, a transmitter. Um, so, so you will see broadcasts showing up that are, that are Taliban broadcasts from time to time, illegal broadcasts. But it's not a really huge phenomena. Um, it's something the military obviously works on to, to try and close quickly. But, uh, but it isn't sort of huge. Um, uh, Beth Mendelson with Voice of America. Hi, David. Hi, Beth. And um, I wanted to talk about, on a programming uh, point of view, I'm in charge of the programming for radio and television for Voice of America's TV Ashna and Radio Ashna. And I've seen tremendous changes in Afghanistan in the four years that I've been working there in terms of the appetite of the people. And you hit on something that I thought was very interesting. This summer we hired a sportscaster. Uh, for our television and radio, and it's been an unbelievable success from from the web and uh, the television and the kind of reactions we're getting. You talked about these these trucks. I think, I think in a way, it becomes a metaphor of democracy. That sports is something that's in, in this society that's really embraced now. And these are the kinds of changes 
that I've seen, and I wanted to find out more about the trucks and to get your thoughts on it, because I find it remarkable, the reaction we get to it now. Um, Afghanistan's been having some successes in the arena of sports recently. Uh, they have a really strong cricket team, for one thing, uh, but they're good at some other sports as well. And, and it's another thing around which a people can, can coalesce and be proud. Um, so I, I, you know, I think it's an important area to, to, be, to try to be encouraging, uh, both at the end of sports facilities that young Afghans can use to get good at sports and, and at the end of, of television broadcasts where the best, in, the best can, be, can be watched by the nation uh, and, and they can be proud about it. Um, yeah, I just I believe in sports uh, for any country, but certainly for Afghanistan. Thanks. I'm Roger Hardy. I'm currently spending a few months at the Wilson Center, but for more than 20 years I was with the BBC World Service. I was a Middle East and Islamic Affairs analyst, a ah. glorious title. Um, we, hand on heart, were you all together comfortable when you got the call from Richard Holbrook, having been a journalist for more than 30 years? And just a point of fact, that you must know there's been a great, sometimes quite fierce debate about how many Muslims there are in the United States with rain, you know, experts or others saying that there are anywhere between two million and perhaps four or five million. How come you're so sure there are eight million? Uh, I'm not so sure there are eight million, and please don't take my number uh, as final. Uh, that was the number that Imam Johari used in the tape, and I simply was echoing his, his number. Um, I'm not an expert on how many Muslims there are in, in the United States. Millions, but I don't know how many. Um, hand on heart was I delighted when I got the call from Ambassador Holbrook. Um, yeah, because although I had been, I, I was a journalist for 32 years, I'm very proud of that. Uh, in my mind, probably I'll always think of myself more as a journalist than anyone, anything else. I, um, I care a lot about national security issues for the United States. This is a big one um, for my country and for yours. And I just think we need to persevere. I feel very strongly about it. And I also felt that there are some things that those of us who, you, you know, you, you're another one, uh, who spent our lives in broadcasting can contribute to this effort. Broadcasting's quite important in a country that has, uh, you know, 20% uh, literacy. Thank you for your initiatives and coming here to explain them. My name's Sue Dodge. I'm with Department of Homeland Security. How do you reach out into the more rural areas um, and, and continue with the cell phone usage and the education programs and the message to counter the violence that's occurring? And also, how do you explain the success stories of job creation and, and the people that you're able to hire through the various programs? How do we explain it to the Afghan people? To the Afghan people and spread that picture. Well, on that last point, uh, we, we've had, since I b became director, we've had a number of uh, media tours where we basically book an embassy aircraft, 16 seats, and we fill them. And we take people around and show them whether, usually it's on one subject, say water projects, okay? We're going to see three water projects, two-day trip, you know. And we've done this several times. We've decided recently to start trying to do it every month. So I'm working closely with USAID. We are working closely with them to try to develop a, an interesting set of programs. But uh, I mean, the first one we did was on agriculture, and it was hugely successful. Uh, there were something like eight television pieces and, I forget, 10, 15 radio pieces that came out of that trip, which told Afghans about some of the things that were happening in agriculture, some of the good news. So I believe in that tool. I believe in the Afghan media. Um, transportation, getting them around. We have a unique asset is that we have aircraft. <laughs> so, and they can't always travel around the way we can. So that's one tool we're using to try and get the message out. Um, what, was your, what was the first half? Spread the information about the jobs that are being created Here are the people that we're employing, and these are the areas that they're working in, and that there's an increase in employment. You know, the uh, m 
in most cases, the employers are Afghan. We might be funding a program, but uh, it's, it's Afghan jobs in an Afghan entity for the most part. That's not always true, but um, we try to help them to, uh, to get the word out. And, and they are. I, I, you know, it, you, met, you, met, you asked about rural areas. That is another issue. But in, in the cities, people know what's happening. And the polling data in the cities is pretty positive. Although people are, you know, they don't want us there forever. <laughs> They're a proud country, and rightly so. Um, you know, they're eager to have Afghan policemen on the corner, and, and, and increasingly they do in the cities, rather than foreign forces. Um, in terms of the rural question, that is more difficult. But radio reaches 83% of the country. 83% of the country hears radio at least one time in the week. So it's hugely powerful, and it reaches way into the countryside. So that is a, an important tool. Uh, you saw the Equal Access Project, where uh, we, we, uh, we have actors and traveling troops and going around and performing. And it's, it's a lot more wonderful than you got to see there. It's really fun. Um, uh, and again, it's an Afghan project devised by Afghans for Afghans. All we're doing is providing the wherewithal to make it happen, encouraging it. Um, but you know the rural areas are more difficult. That's why I'm actually going this afternoon to talk about about uh, rural reach uh, issues having to do with uh, mobile telephones. Um, the the the, fur the more places that have mobile phone coverage, uh, you know, the, the more plugged in people will be. Um, so I, I I strongly believe in trying to help to to make that happen. It is happening, but we'd like to speed it up. My name is Salim, and I work at the IMF. At the beginning of your, your presentation, you mentioned uh, uh, a timeline, you know, since 1772 and until recently, there was a continuity of, a, of a ethnic uh, dominance uh, in terms of governance in, that, uh, in this country until like, actually as late as uh, 1978, the, you know, the Pakhtuns uh, had dominated the governance of this, uh, of this country. Now, uh, in terms of your outreach uh, to the community uh, in Afghanistan, uh, since most of the, that ethnic background people are taken to be sympathizers of the Taliban uh, per se, is there a special effort to be able to address them and you know, taking the cue from the lady that that is where the rural outreach will really work out because that's where most of them mm -hmm. are? Because the present focus was predominantly, uh, as I felt it, maybe as wrong. Uh, that's the perception I got was more urban-based. Or is it uh, the, the, the beginning of the effort that, uh, that you're working on? Well, I, one thing you said, I'm not sure I, I may have misunderstood you, but I don't, I don't think I, uh, agree that the Pashtuns uh, are, are are perceived. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't want Pashtuns to think that we or you think that they're all terrorists, <laughs> and they're not. Uh, it, it's a you know a, a wonderful community uh, with some uh, some very talented people, um, and it's a big piece of the country. Uh, I guess the best way I can answer your question is to say we are funding. Uh, various efforts to increase the amount of Pashtun language broadcasting. Uh, Shamshad Television, for example, uh, which is a kind of a, uh, a, a, a moderate, s sensible <laughs> uh, Pashtun language station, uh, has now got a much stronger signal thanks to investments that, we've, that they asked us to make and we've made in their um, uh, broadcasting antennae and uh, you know other facilities, their broad broadcasting facilities. So, so we're uh, you know we're, we're trying to get more of a discussion going among Pashtuns as to what the future should be for their country and for them. Okay. No, the reason I asked was because you see, just like the number of Muslims in uh, the U.S., the number keeps on varying. There is a debate on what is the percentage of the Pashtuns within Afghanistan, but definitely. Mm -hmm irrespective of whatever number you come up with, it is more than 40% in any case, and mm -hmm. they are the largest community there. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, uh, the Taliban's being from the area that border 
Pakistan and Afghanistan being predominantly Pakhtuns. So there is a perception. I didn't say that you gave a feeling, but there is a perception, a general perception that mm. these people are sympathizers to that. So I think a focus on them, communicating to yeah. them about the success stories, may also be able to have a, a very positive uh, impact on them. Great. Take your point. Hi, uh, thank you. Jeff Shogel with Stars and Stripes. Um, you had mentioned night letters. I'm wondering what uh, your office is doing to, co to combat those letters. Uh, to be honest, that's a good question and a question for the military. Um, because well, you're talking then, about a military matter there. But I guess the question is, why not combat the, why wouldn't that be your job? Because if you want to hit people where they live, you know, using a journalism term, it's one thing to do a TV show. It's another thing to say, I'll kill you. Uh, that tends to have greater impact. So why not make that part of your purview? Well, it is in the sense that uh, some of the kinds of programming we're, we're working with Afghans on are designed to uh, illuminate uh, basically how that intimidation factor is being used. Um, you shine light in a dark corner and it's not so dark anymore. A certain amount of that light is being shone by some of the um, courageous Afghan broadcasters that we are helping to fund doing uh, either fiction or nonfiction programming that, that addresses that subject. But um, I'm not in tit for tat, you know, let's do a press release responding to that night letter. We're, we're not doing that. I mean, apart, apart from anything else, David, you're not geographically positioned. You don't have people in rural Kapisa. That's right. right. So that's right. But the, but the military does. And, right. and in rural Kapisa, if there's a night letter and they know about it, they are, they're looking for how to respond to it, right. both in terms of what they might say and what they might do. I have no doubt about that, having been to the rural Kapisa. <laughs> Any other questions here? Um, what uh, what are you doing to, I guess, either integrate or address uh, foreign media um, domination in certain areas? Uh, and what I'm thinking here is actually, I spent a little bit of time in Herat, and uh, the television stations and radio stations tend to be Iranian, and that's not always destructive. Sometimes it's actually quite constructive. But uh, are you working with, or in some cases, working against uh, foreign media sources? Um, well, we're not the only nation that's investing in, uh, in, in this sector, as you point out. Um, and I guess we're just very conscious of that, and we watch what the others are doing, but um, there's no law against it. Um, in, in Herat, there's a, there's a lively cacophony of voices, I would say, on, on the airwaves. Um, yeah, some of them probably are um, influenced one way or another, financially or otherwise, by, by their neighbor to the West. Um, we watch that with interest, but it's an Afghan matter uh, if there's a problem with it. That's a decision for Afghan ministers to make, not us. Well, in the absence of other questions, we want to thank David very much for a very rich and stimulating. Thank you for coming and speaking on the record. Thank you. Pleasure.